Okay, folks, uh, we'll actually get started very shortly, so just bear with the brother for a second. Uh, just making sure, because it's uh, definitely a lot we're going to be going over, and switch to this, so that way you guys can see my beautiful face, forget the hair, it'll get worked on eventually. So, let's go ahead and get this shit and get started. Today is date, August 10, 2019, and this is how the frack we got here. I'm your host, Most Will, if you can, on how the frack we got here. We do take the events and politics of the week and try and make sense out of it all. Uh, before I do get started, um, just to get a friendly reminder, this is an adult podcast, which means um, adult language will be used and things of a somewhat graphic or extreme nature may be shown, so viewer discretion is advised. That being said, um, uh, for everybody that's around here, welcome. And as you can see, um, I don't know why I have a crap load of spit in my mouth, but that's not what y'all want to know. But anyway, um... So basically, uh, how can we explain this week? This week was probably an oh fuck week, but um, let's start off with this because if you ever have ran to a judge, I know I have, um, judges sometimes seem like they abuse their power. And this video I'm about to show kind of makes me think that judges need to be looked at differently. And the reason why I'm going to show it, and the reason why I think that is because of this. <laughs> Sir, go back into your car. I'll be with you in a second. You better check the registration on this plate soon, mister. Have a good day, Judge. You bet. And as you can see, like I said, anybody who's ever dealt with judges, they have this kind of, uh, how can I put this ever so nicely? Oh, they think they can get away with shit. Um, and like, and it was amazing where he said, I said, well, I don't believe I incurred any special treatment or anything of that nature. Um, bullshit. The first thing you told the guy was, hey, you gotta check the registration on this. And then, you know, toot sweet. And then when the guy checks it, oh shit, he's a judge. It puts the off, it puts the officer in a bind. Where he has to let the guy go. And of course, it's kind of funny where he sits there and says, Well, I didn't use this for special treatment. But you told the guy to check the registration on the car. Right. So at this point, this is this is why it kills me. Where a judge is like, Well, I didn't I didn't do this for special treatment. Yes, you do. Every judge does it. And it's in just as I never really gave it a lot of thought because I try to avoid courtrooms as much as humanly possible as the next person, but it amazes me so that judges do do this. They do abuse their power. And at the same time, they um, they get away with it. So I'm hoping that, you know, in that story, um, that the board does reprimand this judge because he did just throw his weight around and now he's acting like he didn't get caught. So that was just one of the stories that just really just got my attention. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the uh, the elephant in the room. Well, two elephants in the room. Um, but it's going to be difficult to talk about this because, again, it kind of pisses me off. It still pisses me off. But we're going to get through this. So let's go ahead and just go ahead and cover the next story. They cut hundreds of immigrant workers and loaded them onto buses as co-workers and family members watched in disbelief. Por favor, déjense. Please, can I just see my mother? Please. <laughs> 
Jordan Barnes opened up his gym to children with nowhere to go. The kids should be the main priority. If we all put the kids first and do what we can to help them to make this as less painful as possible for them. The raids happened Wednesday in six small towns near Jackson, Mississippi. Federal authorities say the sweep had been in the works for months. According to federal officials, about 600 agents fanned out across the food processing plants, surrounding the perimeters to stop workers from escaping and later processing them for immigration violations. While we do welcome folks from other countries, they have to follow our laws. They have to abide by our rules. They have to come here legally, or they shouldn't come here at all. In 2008, during the Bush administration, ICE arrested nearly 400 people in Iowa. This latest operation unfolded on the same day President Trump visited El Paso amid criticism his immigration rhetoric contributed to the mass shooting there. The acting director of ICE says there was no connection between yesterday's trip and the raids, calling them a long-term operation. Tonight, this woman tells us her husband is among those still detained. She says she's been in the U.S. for 24 years. This church, now a sanctuary for those in limbo, like this one-year-old girl. The priest here tells us her mother is in custody. He's taking care of the baby as her father tries to find his wife. Nearly 300 of the people who were detained here have been released. About 400 are still in ICE custody. They're being held in facilities here in Mississippi as well as Louisiana. Lester? So, again, this is Trump's America, and this is annoying. You're sitting there telling me that, and keep in mind, this was a factory that just had a lawsuit won against it uh, for a little over $25 million, and all of a sudden, the workers are now being raided. So that's coincidence number one. Coincidence number two is that Trump decided that he's going to visit El Paso. Keep in mind, this was after the uh, the uh, mass uh, the mass shootings at Dayton, Ohio, and El Paso, which were within hours of each other. And he went to El Paso, despite a lot of people telling him, "Don't show the fuck up." And at the same time, this uh, on the day he goes out there, this actual factory gets raided. And again, it just makes no sense to me. And I've always said it best that. This whole, this whole attack on illegal immigration makes no sense because we are a nation of immigrants. Some of us came over here willingly. Some of our ancestors got picked the fuck up. We know how that goes. So it makes no sense to me that we are now attacked. We're now, you know, this Gestapo, as I like to call them, the modern day ICE, Gestapo, because that's Nazis, um, are now just pretty much raiding places and and Tennessee was no different because ice was definitely here still here and you can tell because there's targeting specific areas like in my home state of Tennessee it has a large presence there and again the whole idea is that it's separating families you're keeping the children but you're deporting the parents that alone screams a lot and of course what did baby Huey have to say about the whole shit well the reason is because you have to go in, you can't let anybody know, otherwise when you get there, nobody will be there. But a big factor is to let people outside of the country that want to come in legally and in, in, illegally into our country, where they come in in caravans, where they surge the border, which by the way, we have the numbers way down right now, if you see, because Mexico has done a fantastic job. Mexico has 26,000 soldiers right now on the border. They have been fantastic because of tariffs, but I don't care what it's because Mexico, in fact, I'll be calling the president at a certain point. I just hope they keep it up because if the Democrats would change the laws, which I was thinking about putting together, as you know, with the gun situation. So we have immigration and we have, let's say, some of the things we're talking about right now, you have them together. But I want people to know that if they come into the United States illegally, they're getting out, they're going to be brought out. And this serves as a very good deterrent. If people come into our country illegally, they're going out. They're not coming in illegally and staying. We have bad laws. They may get in, although we're being very tough, but they may get in. But it doesn't matter because they're going out. 
And when people see what they saw yesterday, and like they will see for a long time, they know that they're not staying here. Why does that sound familiar, ladies and gentlemen? You heard the State Department say the same thing Trump is saying, and I can't help but feel like that is the most cringiest shit you could ever say. It's the whole thing, like I said, a na I said, it is amazing to me. We are a nation of immigrants. And yet, we're telling immigrants, hey, well, you have to come through through our laws. Um, your immigration system is shit. It takes people 10 years. I mean, here's the thing. Australia's got it figured out. China's got it figured out. England's got it. I mean, uh, the UK has it figured out. Their immigration system is less than three to five years. Do you know how, it's like for anybody that's watching, do you know how long it takes for an immigrant to literally come into the U.S. and be a naturalized citizen? A little over 10 years to be a, to be, to be a naturalized citizen. Do you know how long it takes for an immigrant to be immigrated to the U.S. through the right channels? The same amount of time. There, and, and people, and you can look this up, I encourage you to, you will not find an immigration process in the US that lets people come in within a year or less than a year you won't find it if you do find it please show me because I've been looking it amazes me so that they keep saying we need to you need to abide by our laws to come in you need to abide by our laws to enter the US and at the same time your laws are shit your laws are confusing. Your laws are backlogs from processes that haven't been changed since the 60s. But you got no problem, again, going after illegal, let's say illegal immigrants, which I stopped calling them that. I stopped calling illegal immigrants because these people have come from places that would have meant death. You're telling anybody that escapes death walks multiple miles just to get to a border, just to have a better chance of life. I'm not going to stop them. And send them where? Back to where they came from? There's a chance they might not live if they go back. So of course I'm not going to sit there and send them back. Well, if I was president, because honestly, there's no honestly to me, there's no such thing as legal immigration. The thing about it is, Im immigrants that do come here that are not on the proper record have added to the economy. They pay taxes. Well, most of them, I can't say for all of them, but for a lot of them, they do pay. For a lot of them, for that have been statistically counted, do pay taxes. And they do add to our economy. And, you know, there's a lot of misinformation and propaganda that goes with these immigrants. Because, let's be honest, Trump called Mexicans rapists and murderers and thugs. Imagine what he called black people, besides sons of bitches. But, aside from that, you know, that this whole thing is, is so, is, it's so termed in Nazi that you can tell because they're separating children, detaining children. Children go back with the parents. That's where they're sitting mostly in ICE detention centers. Children. And then you pretty much got kids who, like I said, with school being started, school started for a lot of these kids. And now they come back home, their parents aren't here. And the most heartbreaking thing that I could actually show on this show is something like this. <laughs> Oh my dad! No, the Hispanic people are not doing nothing bad. They're not stealing nothing. Can you do nothing but please open the door for the parents? I'm stuck over there in jail. I'm not gonna have nothing. It's the first day of school for me. My dad brought everything for me to live over here. The rent, and I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna eat. And I'm so lonely right now. I need my dad for me. <laughs> my dad didn't do nothing. He's not a criminal. So the government, <laughs> government, please put your heart. Let my parents be free with the, everybody else, please. Don't leave the child with kindness and everything. <laughs> Ask yourself one question. How heartless of a son of a bitch do you have to be to allow that to happen? And again, it makes no sense to do so. I've always said it best. I'll say it once and I'll say it again. It makes no sense that they're taking the measures that they are against immigration. If you truly want to fix immigration, 
You don't send soldiers, you send lawyers, you send judges. You expedite the process. You honestly make it easier for folks to come to the border and expect to be helped, not to see soldiers, which apparently is Donald Trump's way of actually handling shit. Um, but, oh, hey guys, thanks for watching Eolus. Omarosa says, he says the N-word. Uh, yeah, I don't take Omarosa's word for anything because, let's be honest, um, she was the house Negro in that hen house, so, yeah, I don't trust anything she says. This happens to black people all the time. I get that. But here's the thing what I'm saying is this, that I'm not saying that it's not just Hispanics it's happened to. I mean, keep in mind, they're going after everybody they consider illegal. The propaganda of it all is that they're going toward Hispanics and um, people of, uh, of Mexican descent. They're going after them and making them seem like the bad guy. And I can, and you're right, it does happen to black people where, you know, they, they are on the same boat. They, I mean, you see Haitians, you see Nigerians, you see um, every other ethnicity of our people is running into the same stuff. Now, it may not get, um, it may not get reported as much as this is, but the plight is still the same. So I'm definitely not discounting that, but it is amazing to me that we in this in 2019 2019 and we're still still can't figure out what to do about what to do about this whole situation i mean the answer is there we just it's 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 almost as if america refuses i'm sorry no no let me not, let me not say that some in america refuse to be progressive there needs to be progressive measures taken because that is the only way we're going to move forward. Not just in immigration, not just in women's rights, not just in, in rights for everybody. It's the whole idea that we have to move forward and get out of this 1950s era where everybody thinks everybody's okay because usually it was everything all white. So what I'm pretty much saying in this sense, and like I said, that that as a, I mean, I'm not a parent, I'm an uncle, I, I do love kids, but that is heartbreaking to see because the child, the child doesn't know what to do next. A lot of these children are being put into adult roles because again, for some odd reason, we want to keep the children, but we want to deport the parents. And that never made any fucking sense to me. And again, Trump, I don't really consider how you consider this a win just because the fact of the matter is that you have ran off this racist, um, Aryanist position of deporting illegal immigrants when when honestly what statistical data that you have that says illegal immigrants have been bad for the US aside from Fox News speaking of Fox News um you probably noticed that uh one of their greatest contributors to pretty much anger hate and everything else that Fox News is about has taken a vacation you want to know why because he said this you. It, 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 we have heard from Latinos like, you know, all over the country, mm -hmm. here in El Paso as well, who feel like they're being hunted down and, and under attack. That this attack here in the name of white supremacy targeted them specifically. And we know it because we read it. I want you to listen to what Tar Tucker Carlson said last night on Fox News. And I want to have you help me understand it if it's at all possible. Sure. Listen to what he said about white supremacy. White supremacy, that's the problem. This is a hoax. Just like the Russia hoax, it's a conspiracy theory used to divide the country and keep a hold on power. That's exactly what's going on. White supremacy is a hoax, he says. And I say this to you as someone uh, who serves in this community with the 22 people who were killed behind us because the killer told us of what they look like in the language they speak. So I'm going to cut that short just because it goes to a whole new subject. I wanted to get that little bit because Tucker Carlson said white supremacy is a hoax. You know, the funny part is, have you seen Tucker Carlson on television lately? If you watch Fox News, the motherfuckers on vacation. And it's low. And, and, and I love how they sit there and said, well, Fox insists that his vacation has been in the works. Uh, really? The guy says white supremacy is a hoax. The next day he's off the air. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that, I'm just going to be honest about it. I laughed when I saw that. I said, it is amazing that Fox News, this is their MO. They are just, I mean, Roger Ailes made it a point. If you've never seen um, the, the Fox News special, I think it's on uh, HBO, if you ever get a chance. 
it is a beautiful documentary, and I'm pretty sure it pisses off Roger Ailes because it shows Fox News for exactly what it is. But um, it's the whole idea. And I love how they said white supremacy is a hoax. White supremacy is a hoax, he says. And I love how he pointed out, and, oh, wait, my buddy John. Um, they have to keep the children if they are born here and parents weren't. That's the law. If they're born here, yes. But again, there is a circumvention of that law because they're anchor children. You know, the children are born here. That means that the families, um, mainly the parents, have to be here with them. And that's the reason why a lot of that's the reason why they call them anchor children, um, anchor kids, because the parents would stay with them um, if the child was born here. And that law is that part of law is still in effect for a lot of for a lot of for a lot of children born of immigrants that are here that actually allows the parents to stay here because you know at one point we actually had the good idea to not separate kids from parents but Trump's America what can i tell you but i love the fact where he said there's no such thing as white you know white supremacy is a hoax after we just sat there and saw a judge who was white get out of the ticket by throwing his weight around and then you get this fool who decided to walk into a Walmart is on edge right now. So just consider this. Just days after those two mass shootings, uh, a young man armed with a rifle and wearing body armor surrendered to police after he walked into a Missouri Walmart and just started pushing a cart. Customers obviously panicked. The store manager pulled the fire alarm. A witness described what happened next. A real loud siren goes off for like a second and they say, uh, uh, suspected fire, possible fire, exit immediately. And there's an employee standing there, and I was like, looked at him like that, and he's like, I don't know. And this lady was screaming at us, like, get out now, get out, get out. There were a lot of people hiding outside behind these barriers and, and businesses, and, and it was pretty, pretty chaotic for a couple minutes. Omar Jimenez is following this one for us, and, and Omar, no shots fired. So who, who is this guy, and what was he doing? Yeah, at this point, police have identified him as uh, as Dmitry Andrechenko, as 20 year old. Uh, his background still unclear at this point, but you touched on the main piece of good news. No shots fired and no one injured in this. Now, what they are trying to piece together at this point in the investigation is what motivated him to do this. We know when he walked into this Walmart, according to police, he was filming himself on his cell phone for what purpose we still do not know, and then pushing a shopping cart through the store and again, as you mentioned earlier, that was what prompted uh, the manager to pull the fire alarm and for people to evacuate as quickly as possible. And in the process of all that, this man tried to casually stroll out of the storm or out of the store where he was confronted by an off duty firefighter who was also wielding a weapon and detained that this man, Andrechenko, until police arrived just a few minutes later. But here is how police described their arrival to the scene again, just about three minutes later. He walked in here heavily armed with body armor on in military fatigues and, uh, and caused uh, a great amount of panic inside the store. So um, he certainly had the capability and the potential to harm people. He was compliant with us, um, but um, his intent was not to cause peace or, or, or comfort to anybody that was in the business here. In fact, he's lucky he's alive still, to be honest. Yeah, a guy who walked into Walmart with body armor on and guns, and also what they didn't also what they didn't say because um, it was going to run a little bit long. Um, he had more than a hundred rounds of ammunition on him. Now I'm all for open carry as much as the next guy, but when you have more than a hundred rounds of ammunition, you have body armor on and you have guns, and you walk into a Walmart. What the fuck do you think are people going to react that way? Of course you're going to get detained. And it's funny where I've, I've had this discussion, honestly, with open carry people. And it's funny where they say, well, it was open carry, but he was an idiot. Let me tell you something. I have an open carry license. Do you know how long it's been since I've left the house with my, with my firearm? I haven't left, I haven't left my apartment. Well, I should say my house, but you can tell it's an apartment. Let's just be honest. Um, I haven't, I've never left my apartment without my gun, and it's been almost five, it's almost been um, three years. Three years since I actually used my open carry. Still have it, still active, but I've never had to leave it. Why? Because of the fear. Because of the fear. 
a lot of people don't understand. When we see police, we see police because we know they're police. They're marked as police. So therefore, we know that they are allowed to carry weapons. If you've ever been to a club or if you've ever been to a place um, that's a little more fancy, a shindig, what have you, you'll notice that there's armed security there. They have security. They're certain they're dressed a certain way. They're, they, you know, there's cues to let you know that, hey, the person is carrying, but they're carrying in the role they are. Now, I'll be honest, open carry ha is, is a gray area. Open carry is a gray area. I will admit that so. That being said, if I see a guy who has a, who has a gun on his back or on his hip or on his side, and let's just say he's in Walmart. Let's just say that he's walking around with a Kevlar vest on or any type of body armor. You think for one second that I'm going to stay in the same location this son bitch is at? No, I'm leaving. I've actually done it before. I've walked into a Target where I saw a guy walk around. He didn't have body armor on. He didn't. All he had was just pretty much his, uh, his AR-15 on his back and he had his pistol on his hip and the store where I was at allowed open carry but when I saw that shit and I saw him and he was shopping I turned around put that cart back up walked the fuck out because why I don't know that it doesn't associate safety with me it doesn't associate that I trust this man's judgment because let's be honest you might think you are the safest gun owner in the you might think you're the safest gun owner in these known parts i know because i own guns but there's also a rule with owning firearms you always assume always assume as was always taught to me always assume that the that a complete stranger doesn't know you and with that being said you don't make uh you don't make a calm environment a hostile environment so for me, I don't, I don't, oh, I don't bring my guns out. My guns stay at home, locked up. Occasionally go to the shooting range every now and then. But aside from that, they're not on my hip when I go walking out. Does that mean that everybody with open carry is a fucking idiot? No. There are a lot of responsible open carry people out there that nine times out of ten are doing it in a capacity where it's not going to alarm the public. You do get these idiots out here that I call amosexuals that want to show off their guns thinking that's providing safety when you're basically providing panic and in this day and age you are going to cause panic just because the simple fact of the matter is you have these idiots following white supremacy tones not only the fool I just showed at Walmart but this fool right here that just recently got arrested Carol Connor Climo from Las Vegas is behind bars, accused of plotting to firebomb a local synagogue or a bar serving LGBTQ customers. An FBI anti-terrorism task force arrested Climo on Thursday. According to court documents, Climo used encryption technology to communicate online with people identified as white supremacists and recently told an FBI informant he was looking for places to attack. According to the criminal complaint, authorities discovered bomb-making materials at his home, along with a notebook containing plans for a potential attack and drawings of timed explosive devices. They also confiscated an AR-15 assault-style weapon and a bolt-action rifle. The criminal complaint also noted that a heavily armed Climo spoke to the CBS station KTNV in Las Vegas back in 2016 as he patrolled his neighborhood. If there is a possibly very determined enemy, we have at least the means to deal with it. Climo was not arrested at the time. But again, again, this guy, especially with Vegas, it's only been, what, uh, uh, two years? Since the since the shooting in Vegas, where a guy literally had a shitload of guns in a hotel room and fired upon patrons, in the same city, this nut was planning to do something different. Now, granted, he was going to LBGT, but it's funny where the rhetoric comes from white supremacists, and it comes from Aryan, nationalists, whatever the fuck you want to call yourselves, but you're fucking racist. And it amazes me so, amazes me so, that with all that going on, and I knew, and it's like, it's interesting where a lot of people sit there and say, we lost this battle at Sandy Hook. When kids got killed 
and Congress did nothing, that should have heralded right there what was what was and was not going to happen. However, what did Baby Huey have to say about the situation? He sees it as a win. Taking off support for expanding background checks in the past, tonight the president says this time he's serious. There's been no president that feels more strongly about the Second Amendment than I do. However, we need meaningful background checks so that sick people don't get guns. And Mr. Trump insisting NRA Chief Wayne LaPierre and Republican Senate Leader Mitch McConnell are ready to work with him. I spoke to Mitch McConnell yesterday. He's totally on board. I think in the end, Wayne and the NRA will either be there or maybe we'll be a little bit more neutral and that would be okay too but tonight a spokesperson for mcconnell tells us he has not endorsed any specific gun legislation and lapierre warned mr trump his base won't support background checks according to a source familiar with their call you expressed support for background checks after parkland why is now different time goes by uh, i don't think i'm different but i think the Senate is different. I think other people in the House are different. And the president pouncing on Joe Biden after these comments overnight. Biden's record on race already under scrutiny. We have this notion that somehow if you're poor, you cannot do it. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids, wealthy kids, black kids, Asian kids. I saw his comment. Joe Biden is not playing with a full deck. Biden's campaign firing back, saying he misspoke and that President Trump is desperate to change the subject from his own rhetoric on race. Tell them it's the second anniversary of Charlottesville coming up and they need to divert something. And on the fundraiser hosted by Trump supporter Stephen Ross, who owns part of Soul Cycle and Equinox, the president saying about those calls for a boycott, it just makes Ross, quote, even hotter. It amazes me so that he's going to sit there and tell, uh, really, Trump's going to sit there and tell Biden he's not playing with a full deck. Um, teapot, have you met Kettle? And it amazes me so. Again, going back to the whole rhetoric about universal background checks, I have said it multiple times. I support that. I support universal background checks. I support mental health examinations. I support that you have to annually be, you have to be annually certified which means that you have to go to a training class and show proficiency and show responsibility. I support all of those things. And at the same time, I'll even go for a Chris Rock joke. And I know I shouldn't make a joke when it comes to gun safety, when it comes to gun safety and gun violence, but Chris Rock had it best. Even though it was a joke. He sat there and said, "You know how you he said, you want to know how you deal with gun violence? Raise the cost of ammunition to $1,000 a bullet." Then at that point, if someone gets shot, it's almost like, what the fuck did you really do? Now, in its sense, it was a joke, but at the same time, I almost want to sit there and go, ammo in itself, depending on the depending on the brand of ammo you get, is it could be inexpensive versus the really high cost expensive. But as as albeit an extreme measure as that is, the whole idea to me is like, how is it? that we live in such a gun favorous society and I can't talk because like I've always said I own firearms myself but I'm all for the whole idea of, of exchanging of, of more legislative ma uh, legislative uh, measures I am all for that I am all for universal background checks I'll be the first one to sign up I'll be the first one that think that all guns should be tagged and put into a system. I'll say that. New York already has it. I would be the one to sit there and say um, about, here's my thing. I'll, I'll even go so far as to say ammo. My thing is, if you are purchasing large amounts of ammo, in my opinion, you better sure be in a database somewhere. Because what the fuck do you need all the ammo for? Because you need to be investigated. These guys who created the, who did these mass shootings had tons of ammo and guns. Yes, I will say it. You can argue with me six ways from Sunday on this. If you have a shitload of guns and you have enough ammo to where you can literally run your own Walmart, yes, you should be investigated. You should be in a database because we want to know who you are and you should be. I am not going to sit there and say differently about that situation. The reason why 
a lot of other countries have got to figure it out. New Zealand had one mass shooting, and in one fell swoop, had had um, passed legislation on assault-style weapons. Australia bought back their weapons nearly ten, nearly fifteen years ago. When's the last time they've had a mass shooting? Japan has some of the most strictest gun laws in the modern world, and their their uh, death rate um, by firearms in a yearly basis is less than 4%. So, I love how folks will usually sit there and say, well, gun laws don't work, this don't work, and yet these other countries have figured it out. Again, it's also the thing that bothers me so, uh, Yolas, I, I see you said no, but I have to know what you mean by no. Um, hey, Matt, um, Matt, uh, Derek, thanks for watching. Um, the year, those are occupation nations. No, China is not an occupation nation. Australia is not. They just simply go, I mean, you can't call them occupied nations. You can call Japan. Um, Japan don't even call it occupied nation. Japan doesn't have an army. Yes, it does. It does too. Um, Japan does have an army. Japan actually has a, Japan does have an army, a naval force and an air force. So yeah, they, they do, man. I'm sorry. Um, but again, the whole idea behind legislation, it's always been shot down. I have said this best. We have seen what happens when actions don't lead to anything. When you don't do nothing, history repeats itself. All I'm saying is, for all the naysayers out there about us adding these other uh, things on there, mental health evaluations, background checks, things of that nature, let's try it. If we're wrong, then you can sit there and say, I told you so. But honestly, I'm so tired of hearing I told you so before nothing is done. That to me has never made sense. It has never made sense to sit there and say, well, it's not going to work and we never try it. And again, the one thing that has annoyed me the most is why the fuck the NRA is still involved. Wayne LaPierre, keep in mind, the NRA just last year through the Mueller investigation was found funneling money from Russia to Trump to help his election. The NRA at this point is pretty much a Russian agent. And yet, Trump is calling upon them for their influence and they're sitting there saying, well, Trump, if you back this, you're going to lose support. And, if, and, if for, and if for a, a so-called association of, of rifle and gun owners, you think they would be the most responsible ones out there in supporting this measure. And the simple fact that they're not supporting this measure tells you everything you fucking want to know. So again, it always amazes me so that, you know, whenever it comes to mass, whenever there's a shooting or whenever there's something involving a gun where a guy had a lot of ammo and an assault style weapon, it is amazing how quickly the NRA will sit there and say, well, we don't really need to change our gun laws. That was just one person. When in the last three shootings were all occurred by all turned by white males with white supremacist views, um, America has two problems: America has a gun problem, and America has a white supremacy problem. And it's amazing how much they go hand in hand in the destruction they cause. That's all I'm saying. But moving right along, um, speaking of Trump, um, the, about the impeachments, and he, and this is the last time I'm actually going to mention this because honestly. When it comes to about impeachment against Trump, Democrats, I've said it multiple times on this podcast, and this will be the last time I mention it until we actually get new information, um, specifically Pelosi, um, you now have more than half of your Democratic Party wanting to push forward with impeachment, uh, impeachment proceedings. You are saying, well, we don't have enough information yet. It is now getting towards September. It's amazing how quickly the month of August is flying by. The whole year is flying by, actually. But there comes a time either where you're going to pursue it or you don't. And this wasn't really in this. I mean, the, what I'm about to show next is basically a, a judiciary chair, uh, uh, Jerry Nadler, and his point on it. But it doesn't inspire me with a lot of confidence. I wrapped up in words. But words can matter when they, when they apply to what information you can get and how the American people see it, right? So so I, I'm trying to understand, because a lot of Democrats, they don't want to be forced to vote for an impeachment inquiry, but they presumably would be willing to vote for impeachment itself if you presented well, no them th with the evidence. There's no such thing. Um, the committee has initiated an investigation into the question 
uh, in, into the various malfeasances. So in your mind, the, you're saying this is exactly the same as what we all call formal impeachment proceedings by another this name? Is, this is formal impeach, impe impeachment proceedings. We are investigating all the evidence, we're gathering the evidence, and we will at the conclusion of this, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, uh, vote to vote uh, uh, articles of impeachment to the House floor, or we won't. That's a decision that we'll have to make. But, that, that, but that's exactly the process we're in right now. And that bothers me because Democrats, again, I've never considered myself a Republican. I don't really consider myself a Democrat because there's a lot of shit that, that they do I don't agree with. But what kills me about the whole fucking thing, what kills me about the whole thing is just that you guys ran a platform on impeaching Trump. That's how you got the House. And now it's almost a simple fact of the matter. It's just that um, really you guys didn't say we're still investigating. It's almost as if you're holding the ball. And again, I'm going to make this short and sweet because, like I said, I went on a rant about this. I went on a rant about this in my last podcast. Do something, Democrats. Either say what you're going to do or just let it go. It makes no sense that you're still proceeding and going over the same thing over and over again like shit's going to change. And telling us that you're formally, formally doing it is not saying it until y'all just come out and say... We are now bringing forward the articles of impeachment against the current administration and beginning the process. Until we actually hear that, all we're hearing at this point is just noise. Um, but again, going back to the background checks and the um, background checks and everything else, like I said, regarding this, um, we all know that unfortunately there's one man in Congress that literally blocks, I mean, you know what he is? He is the wall. I call him the wall, the turtle wall, the wall that Trump always wanted, just not in the right location. But McConnell, and it, and it amazes me so, and this is why I sit there and say how powerful the Senate is, mainly the Senate majority leader. And there's a level of power in that because McConnell can block anything that comes from the House before, uh, before it comes up to the Senate for a vote. He can block it himself. The president cannot check him. The Senate cannot check him. It literally has to go through him to get to the floor. And it amazes me so, amazes me so, that anytime the Democrats have pushed something forward, McConnell blocks it. Anytime McConnell wants something done, he railroads it. And the background checks are no different. Lead as President Trump prepares to visit El Paso and Dayton tomorrow, Democrats back in Washington, D.C., are continuing to criticize Republicans for blocking gun control legislation, some of which enjoys bipartisan support. And as CNN's Caitlin Collins reports for us now, this time the person Democrats are focused on is not just President Trump. Amid the political fallout over how to prevent mass shootings, President Trump is headed to the scenes of the last two. Tomorrow, the president and the first lady will travel to Dayton and El Paso. But not everyone will be happy to see him. This is the most racist president we've had since perhaps Andrew Johnson. Trump is facing major pushback from some current and local officials in El Paso and Dayton, including two Democratic presidential candidates urging him not to come. And he is responsible for the hatred and the violence that we're seeing right now. I think he's a polarizing figure, I think especially uh, in El Paso. El Paso's Republican mayor, D. Margo, says he's received phone calls and emails from angry Texans, but will welcome Trump over their objections. I don't know how we deal with evil. I don't have a textbook for dealing with evil other than the Bible. I'm sorry. I, I, we're going to go through this. But, he, but uh, the president is coming out. Dayton's Democratic mayor, Nan Whaley, says she will also welcome the president as well as anyone protesting his visit. He's made this bet and he's got a lie in it, you know. Uh, he hasn't, you know, um, his rhetoric has been painful for many in our community. Uh, and I think that people should stand up and say they're not happy if they're not happy that he's coming. Today, White House officials are firing back at former President Barack Obama after he issued a statement calling on the country to reject language from leaders that feeds a climate of fear and hatred. Nobody blames him for Newtown, Connecticut. This amid growing calls in Washington for action on gun control. It's a piece of paper, but it's a piece of paper that could save lives. 
Democrats want Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to bring back lawmakers from their five-week summer recess for a vote on stalled gun legislation. Mitch McConnell needs to get off his ass and do something. That sentiment heard outside McConnell's Kentucky home where protesters gathered Monday night. Despite the inaction, a source close to McConnell says he's serious about considering gun legislation. Now, Jake, we're being... Yes, Turtle McConnell is serious about considering gun legislation. Right. Um, forgive, forgive me in my level of just flat out. <laughs> okay, yeah. McConnell, keep in mind, Alabama, Kentucky, and he screwed Kentucky so bad that he's now going to consider gun legislation. Uh, you know what? The day that happens will be the day you see a pig fly at night. That's just me. Um, but I'm just going to skip past that because, let's be honest, he's not. He's also not going to bring back Congress, which it still amazed me. So, how the fuck Congress gets a five-week vacation only to come back, five-week, I'm sorry, a five-week um, sabbatical, and then comes back, and I'm like, you know what I noticed? And this is just me, and, and, and agree with me, disagree with me, either way is fine. Is it me or is like Congress like the easiest place to get paid for doing nothing? I mean, aside from various other places that I won't mention on this podcast, but it amazes me so that these guys go in here and literally can dictate the, the direction of our country. And for five weeks, they can just go home and go out or go vacation. And then and what? I mean, what really have you done this year? So that that's just my you know short take about that where I just said you know what I must I must be in the wrong business because apparently being a politician is basically like being an NBA player that's on the bench all the time. You get all the benefits and you still get your contract, but you don't gotta do a goddamn thing. But anyway, um, on the business side of things, um, if you are a stock trader, you're probably not gonna like this little bit more of information I got for you. Financial markets seem to be on a roller coaster. The Dow and other indexes plunged sharply after the opening bell, then recovered most of their losses. Investors are worried that the trade war with China will spark a global recession. Yesterday's recovery was powered by technology and consumer staples and bargain hunting. The FDA is investigating 127 cases of people suffering seizures after vaping. The agency has received 92 new reports of people, especially kids and young adults, having seizures after using e-cigarettes. That's since it first announced the investigation in April. The FDA says they have not established a clear pattern or causes for the cases. Yep, sorry about that. Forgot it was more, one more story into that. So if you're into vaping, um, toke up. I mean, I don't smoke, but hey, knock yourself out. But yes, the Dow is taking a 500, 500 point drop because we are still beefing with China over tariffs. Because for some odd reason, Trump believes that, well, tariffs are great. Here's the problem, as I've said before. You cannot go to war with China. The reason why is because China basically corners the market on production and labor. At the same time, Mostly everything that we have is mostly imported. They actually buy our they actually buy our produce, mainly our soybeans, which they haven't done in a while since the tariffs. They've actually went to Russia and started doing that. So a lot of American farmers right now are actually feeling the heat after the, even after the two bailouts that Trump has already signed for them. So again, if you're in the stock market right now, you're not liking it because it is a fluctuating up and down market. And if you have 401ks, uh, right now, they're probably feeling the heat as far as this up and down goes. And that alone should tell you a lot about where our current economy is. Um, but other things that are just are freaking annoying. Anybody remember Rob Blagovich? You should. He was the guy, not only, not only he was the guy that tried to sell President Obama's seat, um, after he became president and actually got and actually got uh, a sentence for that, Trump is deciding to commute his sentence. Keep in mind, he got 14 years for basically trying to attempt to sell Obama's Senate seat for Chicago, and because he was convicted, he's only served uh, six years of that 14-year sentence. And Trump is thinking of commuting him. Now, a lot of y'all are probably wondering why. Is because basically they have one little connection. They, uh, Blachowicz was on The Celebrity Apprentice. I wish I could make that up. 
Trump always, you know, <clears throat> and I've always said this best, that Trump always tries to bail out his friends. It is starting to become a habit. Hopefully that it, hopefully that he does not, because like I said, it just shows, it just, and if he does actually commute it, that just means that the scary thing about this is if any of Trump's um, people, like Michael Flynn, who's currently about to be in jail, Paul Manafort, who's already in jail, Rick Gates, who's about to be in jail, um, he could turn around and commute their sentences. And that's why everybody's so worried about the justice may not be served, pretty much because Trump is bailing out his friends, which we hope that doesn't happen. So, um, aside from that, guys, there is one other story I'll get to before I get to video games because that's something near and dear to my heart. But I did not know about this. This is actually a new story that just came out, and it kind of echoes some sentiments that I've known people have said about Boy Scouts. It's how a new lawsuit describes the problem of child sex abuse in the Boy Scouts of America. You cannot trust the Boy Scouts of America to weed out the bad apples because they haven't. Accusations of child sex abuse have plagued the organization for over a decade. But this complaint, filed on behalf of one anonymous accuser, alleges 350 new victims have come forward this year. And that the Boy Scouts of America hid the scope of the problem for decades to protect its reputation and the alleged abusers, including a former mayor and a local doctor. That night... Um, we're lights out and I'm going asleep and stuff and I feel a breath on my neck and I feel somebody touching me and I hear his voice. James Kretschmer, who spoke to NBC News last month, says in the 1970s he was molested by a scout leader while on a camping trip. He touched you inappropriately. Oh yeah, yeah, he, he groped me. While NBC News is not able to independently verify his account, we did speak with multiple people who confirmed Kretschmer told them of the alleged incident at the time. We have a client who's 14 years old and we have a client who's 97 years old. In a statement, the Boy Scouts of America says in part, we immediately investigated the limited information provided by the alleged victim's attorneys and made 120 reports to law enforcement. The organization says it believes the victims and sincerely apologizes to anyone who was harmed and that it has taken significant steps over many years to ensure that it responds aggressively to reports of abuse. But Kretschmer says the Boy Scouts of America is beyond repair. The organization should burn to the ground and out of the ashes, maybe an organization will come out that will protect our children. Stephanie, why are they filing the lawsuit now? The accuser's attorney says he was concerned that the Boy Scouts was going to file for bankruptcy, which would put a hold on any new lawsuit. So he put out this public appeal for victims to come forward. And, and uh, keep in mind, it is amazing to me that this is the first time the Boy Scouts of America has been put under scrutiny, especially with child molestation and child abuse. And keep in mind, this is the same organization that didn't want the Girl Scouts to join. Um, for other reasons because they're girls, because they couldn't find a reason. Um, but again, it this is, I mean, it's its one of those things where I'm like, it's its one of those organizations, kind of like, you know, Catholic churches and church camps and all this other stuff, where you just find these stories of abuse and child molestation. And a lot of people kind of think about it from the wayside when really we should be paying more attention to that because... Let's be honest. No, I mean, no child should ever be put into a position where it's going to, or something happens to them where it affects them for the rest of their life. That's just me. That's why I'm like, that's why if someone asked me, it's like, what well, do you see? Would you send your child join the Boy Scouts? Hell no. I mean, I'd rather have, I would honestly rather have them um, go do anything else. And I'm not saying that the boys, and it's the thing is, like I said, I've never been to the Boy Scouts. I never felt the need to go in the Boy Scouts. I'm sure there are great people, some, and I say some, but then again, that's my limited knowledge. But I've also said it this, <clears throat> in this day and age, regardless if you're a man, woman, or child, the, the, there needs to be more protection for those that need to come and speak out. Because I used to say, and I'll be honest with you, I used to say, I used to say so long ago, why is it taking so long for people who are victims to come forward and tell their stories and get the help they need and get the justice they need? I used to say that. Then I saw what happens when the wheels of justice don't work in their favor. And when I saw that shit happen, 
that's when I knew off the bat it is harder for a victim to come forward because the law protects pedophiles, predators, and rapists. I get that now, and that's the reason why I sit. And that's the reason why I sit there and I, I sit there and I see this kind of stuff, and I see immediately where they're coming from, and I get it. I get it to a certain degree, and I apologize for my uh, ignorance, thinking that it's so easy to walk up and explain your story and expect justice to be served, and then it doesn't. I get that, and I, and I truly apologize for my ignorance on that. But, um. Boy Scouts, we say Yolos, Boy Scouts are American boy rites of passage. Uh, okay, well, your opinion. I, I don't. I disagree, but I think personally, Boy Scouts is just an overrated way of learning skills. But hey, what do I know? It ain't, it ain't it, what may me, what may not work for me, may work for you. So let me go ahead and move forward to our next last to our last story for you to get a good news segment. Video games. Who loves them? I love them. A lot of my friends love them, and and if you're a and if you're a kid who plays Fortnite, you've probably been inspired by a 16 year old who uh, just recently won three million dollars for playing Fortnite and while uh, playing a playing a playing and winning a Fortnite championship uh, uh, tournament. Three million, 16 years old. See, mom, video games are not a waste of time. I could have been a millionaire right now. But um, aside from that. Video games are a way, you know, for a lot of us, we grew up on video games. For a lot of us who are in my age, in the 35 and up range, we still play video games. So, with this most, re and unfortunately with these recent shootings in Dayton, Ohio, and El Paso, Texas, it has come up again. Ugh. I really, I really can't make this up. It has come up again because the Republican side has sat there and instead of contributing the violence to white supremacy rhetoric and gaslighting by Trump, they have blamed these mass shootings on video games. Now, I have said it best and I will say it again. There have been studies on this. There is no link between mass murderers or mass shootings and violent video games. They, they love saying violent because they have to say violent. Violent is what gets people's attention. Honestly, video games in general have never led to anything. Video games have ain't been have video games have only been really around for not even close to a century. So what were people fighting over before video games were invented? Because it's amazing how quickly everybody blames video games. Nobody blames religion. Religion has been around a lot longer than video games, and last time I checked, a lot of wars were fought over religion, and mass killings and terrorists were done in religious nature. I don't remember anybody. I don't remember anybody, anybody doing a mass shooting over Mario. Just saying. But the reason why I point this out is basically for two reasons. Because Walmart, Walmart has decided that they're going to remove any images of violence in their store. Now, what they mean specifically is that they're going to remove any video games, any, uh, they're gonna show any consoles that literally uh, said violent video games. Violent video games and, uh, and sort of uh, demonstration areas, um, pretty much where you can play Xbox, PlayStation, those are getting taken down. Um, any types of uh, product demonstrations as far as cut boards and things of that nature, they're being taken down and things of that nature. However, the only thing they don't say in that article what they're not taking down is pretty much uh, guns. So some Walmarts do actually sell guns. Um, <clears throat> I know there's some in Tennessee that still do and various areas. They still do sell guns. So that being said, um, it is amazing to me that Walmart's like, oh, we're going to take down the video. We're going to take down the video games that are violent, but your guns are still going to be up. That makes no sense to me. What do you say, Yolis? Uh, the guy that shot the Navy Yard said video games. No, nope. the guy in the Navy Yard sat there and said video games as a deterrent because they did find a manifesto. So, yes, he did say video games, but didn't change his story because he actually had white supremacist views. But video games, as I'm trying to point out, is the scapegoat. Is literally the scapegoat because, like I said, there's no. It's almost in the same sense that there's no link between it. But now we're removing video games because 
that's the one they lean on. They don't want to lean on the fact that maybe a simple fact of the matter is just that it's white supremacy. Maybe it's a simple fact of the matter is that gun laws are not are not up to par where they should be. How ammo should not be up to par where it should be. How people can get access to them is not up to what it should be. All of that is a reason why in itself we might be leading this kind of stuff. And you're right. And you're right, yo. It's John Crawford shot for unboxed BB gun. You're exactly right. Let's not forget that. And I'm not. And, and I definitely don't want to forget that. I don't want to forget about Tamir Rice, who got who, who got shot for a toy gun. Meanwhile, while well, you got idiots. Meanwhile, you got idiots like Walmart boy who walked into a store with armor, with body, with body, uh, with body armor, with ammo, with guns, and yet he's taken down safely. Including the mass, uh, including the guy in Dayton, Ohio, was taken in safely. The guy in El Paso was shot. So again, I get exactly where y'all is coming from on that. But again, from the store, for them, for the subject itself, is just that when it comes to literally video games in itself, they don't cause it. Video games is entertainment. Now I will admit it will challenge some friendships. If you ever, if you ever played Mario Kart, Smash Brothers. Uh, GoldenEye, uh, Halo, uh, Call of Duty, you know, those multiplayer games, your friendships will get tested. I will admit that. But at the same time, it's not to the point to where you're going to, uh, it's not going to lead you down that path to where you're going to literally shoot up a mall or a theater or a park or a fair or any type of gathering. It's not going to lead you to that. And I love the simple fact of the matter is that there was this article about this where they were actually going to show video game tournaments. Um, ESPN and ABC were actually going to show the Apex Legends, which is a first-person battle royale shooter, similar to Fortnite in a way, was going to have a tournament televised. They decided not to show it because it depicts violence. Right. Now, this article here is actually them actually speaking on the history of, on his, on history of video games and really just coming from a different point, so just bear with it for a few minutes. Video games have been at the center of the controversy surrounding gun violence in America. In 2019 alone, there have been more than 250 mass shootings. When the president spoke on Monday about last weekend's shootings, he focused on the video game industry. We must stop the glorification of violence in our society. This includes the gruesome and grisly video games that are now commonplace. It is too easy today for troubled youth to surround themselves with a culture that celebrates violence. We must stop. James Ivory joins us now. He's a professor and a director of research and outreach for the Department of Communication at Virginia Tech. So, Professor Ivory, what's the evidence show? Does violence and video games, is there a, co a correlation between the two? When it comes to actual serious criminal violence, there's virtually no evidence that video games really matter. We do know a lot of things that influence violent crime and uh, what we do with our time on TV, video games, things like that, that's not one of them. Um, there is a little more interest in research that's on kind of links between playing a lot of games and like the more abstract forms of aggression. But again, when it comes to serious violent crime, video games don't really matter. Just last year, a study was commissioned by the Trump administration that found no conclusive evidence that violent games had any correlation to mass shootings. So why are we constantly blaming these heinous crimes on video games? I think there are a couple reasons. One is probably a little more well-meaning than the other. One kind of well-meaning reason is I think it's very intuitive for us to see bloodshed and gore on a TV screen and say, this has to do something to us. And it might. But again, with all the things that we know are very strong predictors of violent crime, uh, poverty, substance abuse in the house, uh, child abuse, things like that matter a lot. Video games don't really matter much when it comes to serious violent crime, as that study you mentioned said, and as the research community agrees. Um, I think another reason that we like to point to video games is because we don't want to talk about other things that we know are much more likely to be relevant. It is a difficult conversation to have. You're absolutely right. You, you know, we know this platform, 8chan, where the manifesto and others um, were posted. It's known to have a large video game community. It's also known for hateful rhetoric. What do you say to those people who point out to that fact um, to try and justify video games and violence go hand in hand? Well, now, there is some research on, on uh, people who try to predict uh, what are the factors that lead to people being involved in hate speech and hate crime. And one of them is involvement in online communities. Now, of course, this is not to say that online communities are in and of themselves bad, 
But as you mentioned, there are certain online communities that seem to foster people who, who feel hard done by, who might have, have either be uh, already interested in kind of hate group type of activity, or maybe they get groomed into it there. So online communities, some of them at least can foster some hateful behavior. Often these online communities are full of um, young men who feel disenfranchised and young men are also interested in video games. This is a common problem they call the base rate fallacy where you see a lot of young men uh, doing things that other young men do. So you say, oh, the perpetrator played video games. That's true, but so do most young men. Mm. In your research, have you seen a difference on how this issue of video games is brought up depending on the suspect's race? Yeah, we've actually done some research on that ourselves. Um, some of the research was led by some people that I work with up in Villanova in Philadelphia, so I have to give them credit. But just recently we finished a study where we did a, a lab study here and found that when we showed people a, uh, a violent crime that was committed by either a white or black suspect, it was a, basically a mock news story, people were more comfortable with the idea that video games might have played a role if the suspect was white. We also know from looking at uh, almost 7,000 news stories about mass shootings that with school shootings at least, video games are more than eight times more likely to be mentioned when the perpetrator's white. Uh, white people don't play video games more than people of color. So we believe this is sort of evidence that perhaps with some people we, we go looking for excuses more than others. Uh, if a person's race, if other things about a person fit the stereotype, of, of, of that we want for a criminal. Maybe we don't go looking for excuses. And then maybe with certain perpetrators, basically young white men, we might look harder for excuses. So I think a lot of the talk wow. about games might tell us more about the way we think about crime than actually games themselves. Mm, that is fascinating. Eight times more likely to mention video games if they're white. That's so fascinating um, to hear you say that. You know, Hillary Clinton took to Twitter to condemn the president's comments, saying people suffer from mental illness in every other country on earth. People play video games in virtually every other country. The difference is the guns. Is there anything in your research that points to whether other countries have problems? Japan's a huge video gaming industry. They don't seem to have this problem. Yeah, I, I want to be careful to stay in, in my area of expertise. I study video games. I'm not a mental health professional, and I'm not an expert on firearm violence per se. Um, but I think when we say that we know that violent video games don't have a unique effect on violent crime, as you mentioned, we don't see these kind of problems in other countries where there's a lot of violent video game use. Um, I, I, I don't think I have the kind of expertise to point directly to a cause, but I think conversations about proliferation of guns and things like that are, are more relevant, at least, to this conversation. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm well equipped to, to, to lay, lay a certain cause, but I think there are certain things we're unwilling to at least talk about, and certainly a lot of them have to do with firearm policy. So, Professor Ivory, if there was one thing you can point out to the political world who tend to use the video game, argument for their own political benefit. What do you want politicians on Capitol Hill to know about the use of video games and violence? I think it's definitely time we come around to the idea that study after study shows that when it comes to serious violent crime, particularly when it comes to mass crime, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a waste of time and a distraction to talk about media use. Now, again, I think it's okay morally to have a problem with celebrating violence. It's okay to even say maybe playing video games a lot does something to you, but it d definitely doesn't make you a mass shooter. Um, there are other things that affect that. And I think a lot of the people that I would like to tell that, though, I think some of these politicians already know that, and they don't want to talk about what we probably should be talking about. Professor James Ivory, thank you very much. And he said it best. And I've said it once, I'll say it again, as an avid video game player, I have never once had the inclination to go to pretty much go to Walmart and shoot people. Now, what he also sat there and said was, and I love this to death, where it's like the the help that video games has done. And like I said, I'm a big advocate of that. Video games have helped people with, with ADD, ADHD. Video games have actually helped people who are autistic. Video games have helped people who have depression issues. Video games have actually helped those who have uh, high stress, anxiety, things of that nature. I am not saying it's a cure-all. I am not saying video games is the cure-all for these things. I am saying that video games have statistically shown to help those um, in those categories better manage their lives. That is true. That is fact. There is nothing against that. I've always sat there and said it best, <clears throat> just like me. I might have a stressful day. It might have been a rough day for you, boy. But usually, a few hours playing video games, I'm calm. I'm relaxed. I'm good. I'm not throwing on body armor and going to Walmart. But that's the thing I wanted to point out so much 
was that that video games can help. They actually can help with social skills, um, with children um, and adults. They actually can help with uh, making friends. They can also help uh, as far as so many other things. Video games actually help. They don't hurt or they don't lead to pain. They don't. And you can argue that six ways for Sunday, but the proof's in the pudding. And Yolas, yes, uh, thank you for pointing out the, the, the Madden tournament in Jacksonville where the guy literally lost, came back, and came back with a gun and was shooting. And again, people again try to tie that to, uh, to violence. And it wasn't. It, the, him actually losing the tournament did not appropriate him. Um, <clears throat> did not appropriate him uh, to come back and shoot up the tournament. The simple fact of the gun culture, the laws, and things of that nature that we live in accumulated to it. See, sometimes I've always said it. I've always said it. I've always still said it in the show. It's not the environment. It's not the. Uh, it's not the additions to our society. Sometimes it's our cultural environment that pushes us to enable us to do certain things. For example. Um, if you do listen to a lot of white supremacist rhetoric and things of that nature, you're nine times out of ten may be influenced by that. But last time I checked, I listened to Ozzy, I listened to Black Sabbath, I listened to Dio, I listened to Zeppelin, I listened to Megadeth, I listened to Ramstein, and for all those that know those groups, you'll know that I am a very I'm a I'm an avid listener of music. I go across the board. Um, so I always want to keep an open ear because you don't want to deny yourself a great human experience. That being said, those groups I named were one time being blamed for violence. One time. Marilyn Manson was, Marilyn Manson to this day, whenever Marilyn Manson's name is brought up, somebody brings up Columbine because they try to use him as a scapegoat for those, for those individuals going around and shooting up that school. Again, they find different avenues to where they want to blame certain things instead of actually looking at the actual problem. And every time, like I said, from a video game, from a video game standpoint, from any game uh, stammer standpoint, every time it is brought up, we as gamers have to sit there and point out the facts. Because we like to play these games, and it doesn't have to be violent. I mean, some people might like playing Mario, some people might like playing Tetris, some people like playing Sims, some people like playing Starcraft, some people like playing Heroes of the Storm, some people like playing Half-Life, some people like playing Halo, some people like playing Double May Cry, some people like playing Samurai Showdown, and I could keep going on and on and on about the multiple games out there, the different consoles that are out there. I'm not talking about your PC Master Race because let's be honest, you're always going to be there. Um, but I'm saying it binds us. All like from a gaming standpoint, we are bound by that. And at the same time, we're not violent. Now, granted, there may be some choice things that are said online that <laughs> will make you squeamish. But you know, hey, it, it's it's there are some things that you know that are not imperfect. But at the same time, um, but at the same time, um, it's not pushing us. Drug Lord. Oh, Riolus, Drug Lord on the TI-85. Uh, was it Drug Lord or Drug Wars? I think it was... Wait, wait, wait. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, Eolus, hang on a second. Did you mean Drug Wars or Drug Lord? Because I do know, um, before I get to our good news segment, I got to point this out. Anybody who's ever had a TI-85 graphing calculator, um, it was... A, it was... It was... Uh, it was like a low-budget tablet computer. And I don't know, you know, the guys who gave us these games. I mean, they gave us a lot of games that you can put on TIA Five calculator. One of them, I want to say, it was Drug Wars, or is it Drug Lord? Oh, Drug Lord. I'm sorry, Drug Lord. Um, thank you, Eos. Um, so, if you're not aware of what that was, pretty much, you were. Ba it was like having. It was like having a uh, Scarface uh, in digital form on your TIA on your TIA Five. Or is it, no, 85, TI-85 calculator, um, Texas Instruments calculator. So, you know, when you're supposed to be in class doing uh, algebra and geometry with this calculator, we are literally playing games. I admit that wholeheartedly. I was one of those kids. Now, did that, did that point me to a life of drugs? No, of course it didn't. But at the same time, I have actually sit there and seen, um, I've actually sat there 
And I thought it was just genius that a lot of kids got their start in computer programming and even coding because they're the ones that actually created those games and I thought that was pretty cool and of course I thank them because without that I never would have made it through Algebra 2 because I would have been asleep and I would still be in high school. So for those guys who came with those games, thank you. Alright, so let me go ahead and get to the good news segment guys. So what I usually do with the good news segment, it's like I've always sat there and said, we talk so much, we talk so much things about on how the frat we got here that usually they're kind of sad stories, they're terrible, you know, terrible things and accounts of that nature. It's the weekend. You want to have some good news. You want to be able to go outside and see sunlight. Well, in my case, I see cloudy ass skies. But you know where you might be. You might want to get out, enjoy life, open up the grill, knock one back, light one up, as long as it's legal. Um, but anyway, we want to actually have it to a sense to where you're basically going to, you know, leave out on a good note. And I do have three stories like that. I always try to find three stories that uplift or make you laugh or just, you know, make you feel good about humanity. And one of the stories that I do have is this one story out of Georgia where the superintendent gave up his bonus to help students apply for college. Because anybody that's actually applied for college, um, them college application fees are a bitch. And I mean that. Especially, I mean, you know, like, okay, I'll put it this way. Like, I was going to MTSU uh, many moons ago. I don't know. I will say almost uh, 18 years ago. So 18 years ago, I was going I was going to apply for MTSU. Now, the college application fee 18 years ago wasn't that bad. Mine was about 38 bucks for the application fee. I think now, um, for most areas, that uh, I think it's jumped up to 50 to 75 bucks. Now, I could be wrong about that. I do know for some Ivy League schools, it's actually even higher than that. But I love the fact that this superintendent, uh, Grant Riviera, sat there and said that he makes 190000 which I'm surprised they even announced that information. Um, but he decided to take his bonus and pretty much let, uh, pretty much use that for kids to apply for colleges um, as far as paying the application fees. And honestly, I thought that was really cool. I thought that, you know, that's a way of paying it forward and things of that nature. Because if you guys heard me, I said, colleges are awesome. They really are. But I also say at the same time, Colleges for those that want it. Now, I also sat there and said, now, um, trade schools and things of that nature should not be ignored. I've always said it best. There is so much profession in being a contractor, a plumber, a technician, a, a plumber, electrician, uh, a, a machinist, a fabricator, um, an, auto, an auto mechanic, uh, trust, diesel. Diesel on mechanic, and especially specific other categories like that that you learn in trade schools, those also should not be ignored. I tell you off the bat, um, one good friend of mine who I've known since we were four or five years old, I went the college route, he went the trade school route. That man, I can't, I'm not going to say his name, um, but you know, if you, you probably can figure out what I'm talking about very soon uh, for some of y'all, um, but he went to trade school. This man became a contractor, a plumber, an electrician, and this man owns about three homes in three homes in a very prestigious neighborhood. Has you know owns three homes. Two of them, are, two of them are in a prestigious neighborhood. One is a beach house in uh, Virginia. He has several cars, and he has he just now started his third business. Now, all that from going to trade school, and. I tell people all the time, he is, he, I love talking about him. He's a success story. He really is. But at the same time, I use him as an example that college is not all, you don't always have to go to college. College is not always the main road that you can go to after high school. I mean, like I said, trade school, because trades are always going to be warranted. I mean, just like, I mean, just like hospitals, funerals, daycares, are always never going to have slow days. They're always going to be wanted. So will grocery stores. So will business owners. So will banks. So will uh, um, fast food. You know, if you want to open up your own fast food joint or if you want to be a franchise owner and you just want to learn the business aspect of it. I always sit there and say, don't limit yourself to college. And at the same time, for schools, and I'll always be a big proponent of educators, and the simple fact of the matter is, educators don't get paid enough. They really do not. For such a for such a wonderful own profession, educators should be paid more. They should actually be given more. Schools should be given more to keep the programs that they have and bring back the programs they used to have, like uh, wood and metal shop, auto mechanic shops, 
uh, music programs, full on sports, uh, full on sports programs, the whole nine yards. Because if you and also to change the curriculum, like for example, they should actually be teaching kids more about credit, more about credit, more about financial literacy, more about how to balance a checkbook, and more about taxes and accounting and things of that nature. These should be things that should have been taught in high school to where kids are more equipped to leave rather than be preyed upon by early credit cards and lending and things of that nature. It should be. So if you if I do sound if I do sound very Warnerish or Bernie Sanders is because I do like the views that they have and honestly I do miss that because I think that's what made America actually great. It didn't it wasn't great because a white dude decided he wanted to go back to the 1950s. It was actually great because we actually embraced progressive natures and went from there. But again, let me let me get on my soapbox about that. Like I said, it's supposed to be a good news segment, so I apologize. But again, uh, props to that guy for actually you know paying it forward and making sure that kids have a kids have a nice shot. Now, the other story I have, um, which I find very interesting at the same time, if you play lottery, you might want to pay heed to this guy's story. I'm hoping this plays. And here's one more thing before we go. It's a little lesson in being number one. We teach our kids to aim for it. We go to work every day hoping to achieve it. But 2,000 people in North Carolina proved this weekend that sometimes zero pays off. On Saturday, like every Saturday before it, a group of North Carolinians sat down to see if their lotto numbers would be the ones, if they'd be able to call out of work today and every other day. And when the numbers rolled, scrolled, and stopped, four big surprises, all zeros in the state's pick four drawing. Yep, you see them there. And those people you've stood behind laughing at the gas station for all these years, thinking they're nuts for picking four boring zeros. Well, look who's laughing now, because not only did four zeros win, they led to a record payout for North Carolina's Lottery Commission. Officials there say 1,000 tickets were sold at one dollar. Okay, so not the story I was hoping for, actually the video. What I meant to was down here. So pretty much uh, this guy um, had uh, basically realized he had a $6.5 million lottery jackpot. Now, he didn't almost claim it because his granddaughter checked the numbers and she didn't actually take a good look at the numbers. So um, she almost threw out the ticket. Thankfully, uh, Mr. Boker took a second look at it and he's like, oh shit, I won $6.5 million. And I'm going to be honest with you. I thought it was a cool story because, and I tell it was a cool story because, like I said, you know, the elderly is always depend on us to, you know, make sure everything's right. And I'll say it with the lottery. Yes, it is a, I play lottery from time to time. Sometimes I win something, sometimes I don't. Um, and I know the whole thing, you know, you got a better chance of getting hit by a bus. You have, you got better chances of making this on your own. Statistically, I get that. But, you know, for those that spend a dollar, two dollars, you know, it's just it's just fun. It's just fun to to sit back and imagine and and to really think about, you know, life changing money like that can turn around and make life so much better. And I love the fact that I, I do that because, like I said, we all need that escapism sometimes. We all want I mean, just like video games, you want that escapism. You want that 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 what if? You know, what if, you know, what if, like today, like today is the Powerball drawing, like, a, like you have until nine o'clock to go get a Powerball. Let's just say, like, you'll do like me sometimes, if I have a little bit of pocket change, I'll sit there and be like, you know what, worth two bucks, why not? And just to see, you know, and of course, you'll sit there and always say to yourself, well, you know, if I won the jackpot, or if I won at least a million, or if I we won... If I won 50000 a 100000 here's what I would do. And, you know, it's always fun to play the what-if game because you never know if the what-if game turns into the, oh, shit, I actually did one game. And that's a whole other story. But I love that story because it's the simple fact of the matter is that man who literally had a mindset. I love hearing stories about these individuals who win the lottery and they just have the most beautiful, simplistic, not calling them stupid, but simply saying they have such a simple outlook on life that all you can do is there and say it. And he, and he literally told himself, he said, we want to stay here. We got neighbors and we hollered all over the fence. And then my daughter brought us dinner. I, I can't be mad about that. That he didn't sit there and sit. He didn't sit there and go into this whole thing of, 
He didn't sit there and go this whole thing of, oh, I'm buying this, I'm buying that. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do. But I love this man's mindset where they asked him what he wants to do. He goes, well, shit, I'm not going anywhere. My house is paid for. He said, I might get a cane. I might walk I mean, I walk with a cane, so I might want He's like, this is his, he quoted, nothing fancy. I walk with a cane, so I want to buy a car that's comfortable and easy to get in and out of. And he said, my kids are trying to talk me into a sports car. This man... <laughs> The reason why I'm laughing is because he's like, man, I'm trying to be practical. My kid's trying to get me to buy a Mustang or an Audi or some shit. And I love the simple fact of the matter of his mindset. Like, if you are content, if you are content with what you have and you, you know, you get blessed with something like that, you're, you don't change, that's beautiful. It really is. But, you know, like I said, and again, I will probably be, you know, like I'm saying, I always say knock on wood if that ever happened to me. I will go up. Now, I'm going to tell you all this before I get to my last story. If, and I'm on record. So this is recorded and this is live. And I don't mind going on record and saying this. If I ever won the lottery, here I'm going to be petty. How I'm going to be petty, you might ask? I am going to go to my bank, get out the exact amount of my student loans in pennies, and then get a truck to haul said number of pennies and then proceed to where the originator of my student loan debt is and simply say i've come to pay this whole thing out in pennies and i want to see the look on that person's face where they say do you know how long it's going to take and i'm going to sit there and say i have all the time in the world and with a big ass smile on my face and if you're thinking that's petty, yes, it is. I admit that wholeheartedly. But that is one of my dreams to sit there and sit there and say, yes, I paid off my student loan debt in pennies. And yes, they still took it because money is money. Again, petty as shit, I know, but that's one of my dreams I would have if it comes to that. So, last story um, of the Good No segment. And I think to my mind, I said, I always said it best, children are the wisest people you will ever meet. And the reason why, this kid gives me hope for the next generation. Uh, he has a shirt that on his first day of school, this was his shirt. That he asked his mom to make because his mom does makes t-shirts. And, and she asked him, what did you want to have on your t-shirt? This kid comes out of nowhere and says, I want a t-shirt that says, I want to be your friend. And I'm like... I want to be your, I will, I'm sorry, I will be your friend. I should say that. Now, again, I can't knock this child. This child realizes that it's already hard enough to make friends on the first day of school, which for a lot of the country right now, I think the first week of school is already in the books. So, you know, I like guess kids, you know, kids will be, kids will be bullied. Kids will be ratted on. But it's always hard to try to make friends in school. And you see this kid decides to go into a shirt where says, I will be your friend. And his mom sat there and marveled at his wisdom on that. Even so much so that what actually wound up happening is 700, I mean, after she shared it on Facebook, uh, because like I said, she owns a t-shirt business, more people wanted to actually get that shirt. And she literally got bombarded overnight with orders to have that shirt made in various sizes. And the thing about that is, and I sat there and said to myself, listen, and Paul Mooney said it best, listen to the children. And it amazes me so that a child can have as much wisdom as the Dalai Lama in that sense, where all they want to be able to do is make connections with other kids and grow, develop friendships and play. And we see it all the time. A black, a black child and a white child will play together until someone says they can't. A kid doesn't see racism. A kid doesn't see uh, a kid doesn't see color. A kid doesn't see differences. All the kids actually see is a simple fact of the matter. It's just that they see another child similar to them and they simply want to be together. Again, listen to the children. And I love the fact of that story just because simple fact of the matter is a child took it upon himself to sit there and say, I will be your friend. And it kind of takes me back to Star Trek, um, where uh, Spock's death scene, which 
Still, I'll be honest. Again, confession time. There's only four times I've actually had tears in my eyes watching the movie. Star Trek, I think it was, uh, shoot. Ah, uh, crap. I want to say it was the Wrath. No, it wasn't Wrath of Khan. Was it the Undiscovered Khan? What is the Undiscovered? No. Okay, help me out here for all you Star Trek fans. The death scene where Spock dies because he saved the Enterprise by basically exposing the dilithium crystal, uh, crystal chamber and pretty much giving them warp drive. I forgot the name of which Star Trek movie that is. But and there's that one scene where he literally sit there and says to Kirk to his face, I shall ever, I shall always and forever be your friend. That tears me up all the fucking time. I admit that wholeheartedly because I am a Trekkie fan. But I love some of fact the matter is that friendships with children always carry such a weight and that this kid is just wanting to basically be the one to be somebody's friend says a lot and gives me hope, uh, honestly, about uh, this country. It really does. And what you say, Thomas, I'm uh, sorry, what you say, oh, Alex, what you say, this kid will be a dungeon master later in life. <laughs> Probably will be. Oh, yes, the Wrath of Khan. Thank you, thank you, Alex, because I couldn't remember that. I couldn't remember which Star Trek movie it was for, for spit on that one. So thank you for that. But anyway, uh, that's going to do it for how the frack we got here this week, guys. Thank you, everybody who was watching. I apologize. I was kind of hopping between the comments uh, on this one and on my watch party because the watch party is going to be going on continuously. So feel free to, if, you, uh, if you're watching this or just caught this in the middle of it, Feel free to comment there because I'll still be able to see it and go from there. So I do want to thank everybody because we did have a lot of people jumping in and out. And I appreciate you watching all the same. I actually saw some shares. And again, I appreciate that too. Like I said, I'm basically trying to reach out to folks and just really try to change the narrative on, uh, trying to change the narrative on how we approach certain things. So thank you for all who shared and commented, things of that nature. So um, you always have been and you always have been and will always be my friend. Yep, that's how the quote goes. Thank you, Alex. Um, but again, I'm not trying to tear up because every time I hear it, I want to freaking cry. So thanks for that. Um, so <laughs> I, had to, I had to give Alex, Alex, my buddy, I had to give, I had to give him some crap sometimes. But um, aside from that, guys, some shameless plug before I do get out of here. I am not the only cat that actually does have podcasts. Um, very soon, uh, Thomas Reed, a uh, guy who I work out with, as you probably seen on my Facebook and on his Facebook, we call him Mountain Puncher, has his fitness podcast to be determined. To be determined is a fitness podcast because you've ever seen Thomas Reed. Yes, this man does work out seven days a week. He does not believe in rest days. I do. Um, but that being said, he does like to talk about workouts, such like nutrition, talks about things that have worked for him and may work for you, and just certain subjects he feels that need to be addressed within the areas of fitness. That's usually every Saturday. It will be in about the next three hours at 3 p.m. on his Facebook Live. Just look up Thomas Reed. Also, my other, my other brothers who are usually with me, um, or will be with me today, uh, A. Stephon Westpoon, uh, Big BZA Dot on YouTube, of A. Straight, A. Stephon Westpoon on Facebook, has several podcasts of his own. He actually has, uh, as far as I get that reference, VST, which is a mini podcast that goes over various news and music and things of that nature. Highly informative, just like my show. He actually has Rhythm This, where you can reminisce over the rhythm, where he goes with musical albums past and present and race into a four-tier system. He actually does also allow for amateur artists to, to post their music to be graded. And yes, we will judge you, but we will encourage you. Um, so if you want to do his Step Into the Ring format, just reach out to BBZA Dot on YouTube, A Step One Weatherspoon on Facebook, and he'll give you the details on upload your music from there. He also has Random as Fuck with Uncle VZ, which will also be later today. What is Random as Fuck? Random as Fuck is the pool of ratchetness we sometimes dip our toes into to take a break from life and have a chuckle. Some videos will make you think, some videos will make you cry, some videos will make you wonder what the fuck. Like my personal video of a woman that's literally at Burger King while it's on fire waiting at the drive-thru for her change and all the Burger King employees are outside watching this lady wondering when she's going to pull away at the Burger King restaurant is on fire. I wish I could make this up. We'll actually be later today as well, as he'll be here, so it'll be a full house then. Uh, also, my other brother from the mother, Trace Brown, um, uh, DJ King Eddie Wayne on YouTube, Trace Brown on Facebook, has a couple podcasts of his own. He has the Bump Down, which Bump Down is a musical podcast that goes with what's hot on the charts, what's uh, hot on the underground, and he talks about up-and-coming artists, and also, uh, for he also does play amateur artists as well, so if you want your music to be played on the Bump Down, reach out to uh, Trace, whether it's uh, DJ King Eddie Wayne on Facebook, or Trace Brown on, uh, I'm sorry, DJ King Wayne on YouTube, uh, Trace Brown on Facebook, and he'll give you the details on how to do that. He also has a Smoke of Truth, where he always will deliver and always wants all the smoke. 
And if you don't know what that means, I can't help you with that. But again, it's that it's an un, it's pretty much a where where Saint Spirit Go Tread, not for the Fan of Heart podcast, in which he is going to tackle some um, sometimes controversial subjects, sometimes subjects that are not really heard of but need to be talked about. But again, if you can check your ego at the door, if you're willing to talk with an open mind, then the smoke truth will be for you. You can go on Trace Brown, you can go on Trace Brown on Facebook to see when he'll be uh, when he'll be doing going live with his podcast. And also, if you look up Ace Step One Weatherspoon on on Facebook, you'll see a calendar where his podcast will be there as well. And also, some other brother from a different mother, John Wingnut. Yes, that is his last name. Love him like a brother. He actually has a he actually has a gaming channel called Wingnut Gaming. Uh, Wingnut Gaming is basically his gaming channel. The man does Call of Duty. The man does Battlefield. The man does Fortnite for reasons beyond my comprehension. But hey, different strokes for different folks. Um, definitely is a social. Definitely is a social dude. Um, does love to joke about it. Like I said, I've known the guy. Oh. God, I think Alex. I think I've known you and John the same thing. I think we've known each other for what nine, nine, ten years now. Anyway, but again, love the guy. Like, love the guy like a brother. Definitely is funny as hell, especially when he's playing Battlefield. Not sometimes. I I need to get Battlefield to actually play with him. Um, but I do play with him on Apex Legends. But um. Definitely uh, fun to watch. Like, share, and subscribe. So if you go up to Wingnut Gaming on Facebook, you'll know when he goes live and goes from there. And of course. With uh, yours truly, I do have the How the Frack We Got Here podcast every Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon. I do also have my Off Limits podcast, which will be a little bit later. Off Limits podcast, as I've always sat there and said, is a podcast that goes there. Now, what I mean by that is, in life, we have been told many times, don't discuss politics, religion, various subjects, because we don't want to upset people. I personally believe what actually... um, I personally believe what actually happened is once we stopped avoiding talking about those subjects was the death of civil conversation. And that's what Off Limits is. We go to those subjects that not too many people like to talk about but need to talk about because we need to bring back civil conversations. We need to bring back conversations that it's not yelling. It's not yelling that we're trying to talk over each other. We're actually trying to get our points heard and we're not trying to dismay or persuade. We are simply trying to understand. And that's what Off Limits is about. Like I said, it's subjects that you normally wouldn't hear on other things, but at the same time, we try to actually come to a consensus or at least try to hear each other out. So Off Limits podcast will actually be later today uh, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, Central Time. And thank you, Alex, eight years. We all started working at hell in 2011. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Um, he, I, we say hell, but we mean Dell. Um, yeah, 2011. Oh my God, 2011. Yep, eight years. Thank you, Alex. Um, and Alex, also, I don't know, oh, Alex, do you still do your? Well, I'll ask you later, dude. I don't want to. I don't want to put you on blast right now. I'll ask. I'll ask you later uh, when we do our thing. But anyway. Uh, we all have active YouTube pages, so if you look up how the frack we got here, if you look up all of his podcast, if you look up uh, uh, Big BZA Dot, if you look up DJ King Wayne on YouTube, all these are active YouTube pages that actually have all of our podcasts from beginning to end, so you can like, share, and subscribe from there. And also, what I usually do on, on how the frack we got here, if there's subjects I didn't cover, if there's stories that I haven't brought up that you believe are just as important, Please reach out to me, whether it's William Buchanan on uh, William Buchanan on Facebook or how the frack we got here on YouTube to let me know. And like I said, I will do my I will do my damnness to research it and make sure it's accurate as far as what we're reporting. Because like I said, um, to really end the podcast. And yep, Derek, you're right. 2010 for you. Um, but again, wow, we have known it. Wow, I've known I have a lot of friends I've known almost a decade now. I'm kind of proud about that. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> The thing about this is about how the frack we got here, it's all about staying informed. I, I like saying staying informed because you don't want to accept anything at face value. You really want to go in and actually do the research for yourself. You're looking beyond what you're told, so that way you can actually find what it is that's true. And then once you've done it, you can go back and show others how you've done it to hopefully inspire them to do the same. Because uh, not to take away from uh, the newsroom, one of my favorite shows, um, but to take an excerpt for them, an informed community can make a lot better decisions than an uninformed one. And this is the part where I sit there and say it's my own because an uninformed one pretty much got Trump elected and this is how the frack we got here. So, 
Thank you, everybody, who all is watching uh, live. And if you're watching this on the playback, just go ahead and comment live, as, you know, as I know some of you will. And again, thank you all, guys, for sharing, liking, and commenting. I really appreciate it. Hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Hope to see you guys later, later a little bit on uh, Offense Podcast a few hours from now. But aside from that, enjoy your weekend.